heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 263, covering the week of May 24th through May 28th, 2021. Glad to have you back in the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, like our Facebook page, and subscribe to our YouTube page. You can find all those social media accounts at our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. That's A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E institute.org. While you're there, give us an email address. We'll give you a free ebook exploring the Southern tradition. It's a great book, free of charge, just for giving us an email address. You'll get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday or Tuesday through Saturday, depending. But that's our way to keep in touch with you. So that email address is vital for our mission to explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition because we can keep in touch with you and That way, we can help expand our mission and our educational mission. That is our goal, to get people interested in the real Southern tradition, not just the simple caricature of that that you get through modern media. So that email address is how we'll tell you about our conferences, our website, our articles, all the things that we do, this podcast, our videos, all of that stuff comes through that email address. So please don't block us or unsubscribe from that, you do get an email at least once a day from us, and that's how we keep in touch with you. Also, while you're at abbyvillinstitute.org, click on that support tab. You can donate monthly, annually, or one-time gift. And again, we exist on your generous contributions alone. This is a tax-deductible donation to the full extent of the law. So if you like the things that we do, consider a donation to the Institute. Of course, we had our Zoom webinar this past Wednesday, and that's a I mean, it's a great thing. We had a lot of new people in that because we had some time there. We had a few tickets, so people that had never seen one of those before signed up and enjoyed the webinar. And, of course, if you go to abbyvilleacademy.org, abbyvilleacademy.org, you can get a replay of that or if you missed it. So we sell those webinars there as well after they're over. This was our sixth webinar. So uh, we're doing one of these a month, and they're a great success, and we want you to come and participate in those. So all of that stuff, of course, is what we do at the Institute, and we do appreciate any support you throw our way. All right. Well, let's talk about the material for the week. And uh, we had a lot of good stuff this week. I I think that uh, this week really had some good intellectual material. Now, that said, let me start with the overall theme for the week at the Institute, and that has to be the ongoing process of Reconstruction. You see, there are different phases of Reconstruction in America. The first, of course, was immediately after the war, and Lincoln's initial goal, as he said in his second inaugural, and I think as he was setting up, was in some ways a resumption of the Union. I don't think Lincoln initially was looking at a radical restructuring of American society. Of course, there were some things on the table that were going to change the United States. But Lincoln had even told Southerners, look, we're not looking to change everything radically. His 10% plan was not a radical departure from the status quo antebellum as far as who could participate in the government. I think Lincoln, as people like Paul Escott and others have pointed out, uh, was simply looking to create some type of new party. And it was going to involve Southern Whigs. He was looking to resurrect the Whig party. You know, Lincoln was an old standing, uh, long-standing Whig, an old-time Whig. Henry Clay was his mentor. And so I think Lincoln was looking to put that back together. And so Lincoln's departure from the status quo antebellum wasn't as great as, say, Thad Stevens who is now is the darling of the left and even the right. I mean, I think when you start looking at, we're going to talk about this with people like Alan Gelzo, men like Thad Stevens are somehow conservative, which is just remarkably stupid. But uh, Lincoln was not that. And now, could Lincoln have controlled these radical Republicans? I'm not so certain. You know, Lincoln had a lot of capital. Certainly there was a belief that maybe Reconstruction would have been different had Lincoln survived past April 1865. But we get Andrew Johnson, and of course Andrew Johnson is not very good at handling the radical Republicans within the Republican Party. Johnson didn't have the same political capital. No, I don't think Johnson was as much of a disaster of a president as others portray him to be, simply because Andrew Johnson had some really solid vetoes. I mean, Andrew Johnson, in terms of adhering to the Constitution as ratified, was fairly good. Uh, There's a little question now. Johnson the man? Johnson the man was problematic. 
But Johnson was even harder on the South than Lincoln was going to be. And this is the remarkable thing about all of it. Johnson is criticized for being too easy on the South. Lincoln would have been even easier on the South. So this is the, the amazing thing when you start looking at presidential history and what people have to say about Andrew Johnson or Abraham Lincoln or this Reconstruction period. But of course, we had Reconstruction at that time. And most historians cap it at 1877 when you have the election of Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, which was a stolen election in many ways. I mean, you could look at it that way. We talk about stolen elections in 2020 or 2016. The Democrats complain that Trump stole the election in 2016, and the Republicans can claim that, uh, complain that Democrats stole it in 2020. We had a stolen election probably in 1876. It's very close. We know that some states had two ballot returns, and so which ballot returns are we going to look at to get the Electoral College votes in those states? So Rutherford B. Hayes steals the election, and the Republicans steal it in 1876. It should have been Samuel Tilden, and so Reconstruction ends. Now, both Tilden and Hayes had already promised to do it. They were going to pull their troops out of the South, which is what was keeping military Reconstruction in place. And so then for a period of time, we have the return of the Democrat Party, and its control of the South. That is maintained up until the middle of the 20th century, when often it's said that we have a second Reconstruction. And that Reconstruction had to do more with the social environment of the South than anything else. But, but you can see that Reconstruction really didn't end in 1877. In fact, I think this is just because historians like to compartmentalize things. And they, and they only want to focus on the social side of Reconstruction and not the other parts of Reconstruction, with which William Dunning does a much better job in, in covering in his book on Reconstruction, which is now panned by historians. You can't read Dunning. You can't read the Dunning School. Those people were just a bunch of racists. Okay, but did they have some valuable things to say about Reconstruction? Yes, they were pointing out that Reconstruction was comprehensive. It wasn't just social. We were looking at a radical restructuring of America, not just the South, but the United States, and that would be economic reconstruction. The New South is the economic reconstruction of the South. It's reconstruction. It's recreating the South. It's moving away from the agrarian model into an industrial model. And this takes time. It doesn't happen in 1887 or 1897 or 1907. It takes time for that to happen. And this is why you have the agrarians. This is why you have Dabney pointing out all the problems of the reformists and all the economic situation. This is exactly what they're talking about the transformation of the South into a mirror image of the North in many ways. Not always, not, not, not completely, but in many ways. And this is why when you look at Southern literature in the early 20th century, it's wrestling with modernity. And that modernity was certainly part of Reconstruction and Recreation. So all of that is going on. You also have, of course, the political restructuring of the United States, the expansion of uh, what you would call the northern democracy, and how that's going to work. All of these things have an impact, not just on the south, but on the north and the west. And so Reconstruction is ongoing. In fact, uh, at, at my own McClanahan Academy, I'll just pitch that for a second, my own McClanahan Academy, I have an entire course on this, Reconstruction and Recreation, 1862 to 1975. Now, I could continue that. I could actually have a new lecture in that class. And if you ever sign up for those, if I do put new lectures, you get those Lifetime membership for those classes. But the, the, uh, the process of restructuring the United States continues into the 20th century. And then, of course, probably into the 21st century, if you look at what's happening now. So you see a, a, a trend here developing. So then you get the second, what's all called the Second Reconstruction, which is all about civil rights and, and what's happening with segregation and other things in the South. And that's changing the United States as well. I mean, look, you had race riots in northern cities. One of the ones that's uh, most prominently talked about now is in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which you could say, well, Oklahoma was a southern state. Um, in some ways it was, yes, but in many ways it wasn't. I mean, so you have uh, the, these situations going on. And then, of course, you have the Boston riots in 1970, I think it's 75, over forced busing. I mean, this is certainly part of Reconstruction. Fast forward to 2021, actually since 20, say 2015, 
into 2021 for the last six years. We've been going through another phase of reconstruction. And this one has to do with historians more than anything else. And what we're doing in, in this, and we have people like Alan Gelzo, this is a long-winded way to get to Alan Gelzo in the first piece of the week. You have this process by which the United States is recreated, and a lot of that has to do with how we remember the history of the United States. This is why the Confederate monuments are so important to the neoconservatives and to the left for tearing down. Because if you leave those monuments up, it's not about racism or white supremacy, because we know if you look at the documented material, that's not why these monuments were put there. If you're going to be honest, they weren't. But they represent something that these nationalists and these leftists can't, can't accept. That is an American tradition of decentralization and resistance to stupidity. And what I mean by that when I say resistance to stupidity is the Lincolnian vision of America, which is the singular United State, top-down, one-size-fits-all government with a reformist agenda just completely obliterating everything traditional in America. Now, people would say, well, yeah, but now you're just talking about things and race and... No. Because what happens when you have a one-size-fits-all government? I mean, look at what's happening in D.C. now. We're running the United States for California and New York. Everyone else is just getting chopped up in the middle. All of the economic aid. I know some of it has gone a lot. It's gone to states all over. It's gone to every state in the union. But the states that shut down the most are the ones that needed supposedly more economic aid than the other states. The, the southern states, many of them just kind of stayed open for this entire period of time that we've had for COVID. The state in which I live, there were some restrictions, but most, for the most part, it was open. And you could go about your day and do what you wanted for the most part. But not so in places like California, New York, New England, the West Coast. So we're running the United States for two areas. And that's dangerous for the rest of the population. You see, the Southern tradition represented federalism. It represented this Jeffersonian vision of a decentralized America. That's what those statues, and resistance to tyranny, those statues represent that more than anything else. And so the neoconservatives can't have that because that, that's a threat to their Lincolnian vision of America. It's a threat to their Lincolnian utopia, which they think that what all the only problem is. And you look at people on the, on the right, if we could just vote better and get better people in there, have a strong central authority based on Lincoln, everything would be great. But also people on the left think this exact same thing. Colin Woodard, whose interesting book on you know, this div divisiveness in American history, now he's ha he has a book out where he talks about what we need is a Lincolnian vision of America. He's a leftist. Now, in some ways, this is attractive, right? The whole idea of uh, I'm sorry, reconciliation was kind of a Lincolnian vision of America. We're all just kind of, we're in this together. We're all Americans. We like to go out and kick everybody's butt and be great and strong and do all these wonderful things. We're going to be the big boy on the block. We're going to be the empire. In some way, I mean, that's attractive to people. You want to be those people. You don't want to be the people getting run over by the big boys. You want to be the big boy. You want to be the guy on the block who doesn't have anyone threatening them. But on the other hand, that guy on the block, if it's not a moral or ethical society, is going to create problems. And we're seeing that in American society now. And plus, not everyone wants to be friends with that person. And so maybe there's a better way. We can all join together and be the big boy on the block, or we can just have the one bully, and it bullies everybody, home and abroad. And that's the piece by Boyd Cathy. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. This is what Southerners were pointing out. So let's start with this idea of the neoconservatives and their love affair for the Lincolnian myth, the righteous cause myth in America. And if you don't know who Alan Gelzo is, he's now a professor uh, at Princeton University. He used to teach another institution, but he's a professor at Princeton University. When you go out and you see videos that are done by the History Channel and other places that they want to call in a conservative, it used to be Richard Brookheiser, uh, and um, you know Brookheiser still does these every now and then, but he's, he's getting a little older, I think slowing down a little bit. And so now you have Alan Gelzo, who's often 
run out there as the guy that we have to talk. He's the conservative voice. Alan Gelzo is also advancing in age. I think he's near 70 years old. And so you have a, both of these individuals. Now, I'll say this about Alan Gelzo. Gelzo. He is very articulate. Alan Gelzo is extremely detailed. He has a wonderful voice. He is someone who can tell a great story. So he's got some really good qualities as a historian and as someone who can be on television, which is, of course, what we often get our history from today is our television, our screen, our movies, our television. A lot of, his, a lot of Americans don't read books anymore. So Alan Gelzo has all the qualities of someone who will be great for having this type of telecommunications. But the problem is Alan Gelzo, I think, genuflects Abraham Lincoln every day and then splashes some holy water on Honest Abe and reads his Gettysburg Address as some sort of biblical prophecy. Now, Gelzo was a religious scholar, so he is certainly someone who, is, who understands religion. I mean, he does. But the fact is, Gelzo has come to believe, and I mean, he's, he's pompous. I mean, that's one thing you'll say about Alan Gelzo. Whenever you see him talk, and of course, Alan Gelzo debated Don Livingston years ago at the University of Virginia and uh, lost the debate, he sulked, apparently. He stewed and sulked and brooded over this, complained that the thing was rigged against him, called one of the students there, uh, you know, essentially a, a, a traitor, and this is his language. I saw him give a talk one time, and a guy had the, had the audacity in Gelzo's mind to stand up and say, well, sir, what you're saying sounds true. He's talking about Lee and how Lee was really a traitor. He says, well, on the surface, it sounds true, but, but didn't the Confederacy actually I mean, so if Lee wasn't part of the United States any longer, can you really say he committed treason? So Gelzo's response was, well, I would give you a lecture on the on the uh, legality of secession, and you would lose. But I'm not going to do that right now. You see, the pleb had the audacity to stand up and challenge the great, wise, sagacious Alan Gelzo and say that maybe you're wrong about this idea of secession being treason. No, 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 I'm never wrong about that. Uh, Gelzo would lose a debate with anyone who knew anything in about five seconds on the question of is secession treason. But I digress. So you have Gelzo writing this piece for a very prominent Christian website. I think it's called the Gospel Coalition, right? And he writes this piece and he talks about we need to bury the lost cause, the lost cause, and he goes into a type of biblical attack on the South. But more importantly, he says, look, the lost cause is a joke, essentially. He's saying this is a joke. This is all fabricated by Southerners. It's all made up. Everything they're saying is a lie. It's a lie. And so we need to get rid of the lie. I remember, you know, Clyde Wilson talking about this. And he would say, the problem with all these people is they say Southerners lie. Now, are Southerners lying about anything here? Are Southerners lying when the war is over about what they were doing? If you read the neoconservatives and you read the left, this is where they're simpatico in this. They believe the same thing. This is why when I say the 1619 Project and the 1776 Project are two sides of the same coin. There has to be a bad guy, and the bad guy has to be the South. Now, for the 1619 people, the entire United States is bad. For the 1776 people, it's just the South. You see, but there has to be a bad guy. And it all goes back to the South. So we can just get rid, we can just purge, we can scrub, the, the term they like to use, we can scrub America of these Confederate monuments, of this lost cause mythology, as they say, of all these people. that We can scrub America of John C. Calhoun. John C. Calhoun was not American. He was a heretic, as the new biography that's very popular says about Calhoun. He's a heretic. A heretic of what? I mean, is he a heretic of the accepted leftist vision of America, which is the proposition nation, which the conservatives also align with. Well, yeah, if that's the case, then yes, he was a heretic. He didn't believe in that. And most Southerners didn't either. But we have to say that even in the founding generation, they didn't really believe it that much either. So this fact that Lincoln revolutionized the revolution, as Gary Wills says, in 1863 with the Gettysburg Address, this is what happens. Right? So then everybody picks up on that, and Calhoun becomes the heretic. He's the heretic 
to a certain sect of Americans in the antebellum and postbellum period. And those, are the, those are the Americans that believe in the proposition nation. That's who he's a heretic from, right? But is Cal Calhoun a heretic in the American tradition? Absolutely not. In fact, you could find more people like Calhoun than not. So are all those people heretics? Well, this is what Gelza would say. These people weren't Americans. They're basically Nazis. This is what, I mean, and you look at what the Genovese say. And we have a wonderful piece next week on this. Look what the Genovese said. Well, this is just stupid. You can't call Americans Nazis. There's nothing of the kind. You can't call Southerners Nazis. Southerners were fighting the Nazis, as we put out many, many times on the Abbey Bill Institute website. Southerners fought the Nazis. They didn't see the Nazis as them. They saw the Nazis as Nazis. This was a terrible ideology. And Southerners, descendants of Confederates, went out and were killed in large numbers fighting Nazis. And so you have, I mean, look, it's very clear that Southerners were not Nazis. Southerners never were Nazis. And anyone that tries to say the Southern tradition is somehow that way is just stupid. It's ridiculous. We, I know there are people that run around trying to do this now, but it's ridiculous. So this piece by Tom Hervey on Alan Gelzo is wonderful because he simply takes apart this idea that the lost cause is wrong. And he takes apart Gelzo's arguments piece by piece by piece. And Tom Hervey is not a trained historian. He's an amateur historian. He's just interested in Southern history and Southern philosophy and Southern politics. And he looks at Gelzo's piece and he did a fantastic job tearing this thing apart. But of course, this is part and parcel of Reconstruction. This is what I was saying at the beginning of this, of this show. It's part and parcel of Reconstruction because what we're seeing is Alan Gelzo continuing the arguments that were made by some Northerners right after the war. Secession's treason. Well, Northerners called it that. We know this is the case. We know many Northerners wanted Southerners punished as traitors. We know this term was actually used during the war. Well, you know who didn't use that term, really, was Abraham Lincoln. And we know that there were many Northerners who didn't think secession was treason. We know that there were abolitionists who were secessionists. We know William Lloyd Garrison favored secession. We know that Frederick Douglass at one point thought that letting the South go was going to be the best thing for America. What's interesting about Frederick Douglass, and again, he's another new darling of the left and the right. There's a new book out about Frederick Douglass and... Um, but we know about Frederick Douglass is that essentially what we're looking at with our current interpretation of American history, it's Frederick Douglass's interpretation of American history. This is what we've gotten. We've gotten Douglass and Du Bois as now the two leading scholars that are interpreting American history. On the left and the right, this is what we've gotten. Well, that's just interpretation. Interpretation is always up for debate, but yet the neoconservatives on the left would say the debate's closed. Gelza would say it's closed. There's no argument here anymore. Well, of course there is. This is like the lefty scientists run around saying the debate on global warming is over. Or the debate on, you know, the science has settled on COVID. Well, is it? Have we seen that or not? This is the most important part of all of this. Even history, the interpretation is always there. And what we're seeing most of the time, history is open to uh, subjective interpretation and so we're seeing that over time with all of these things. And I think that's the, the worst part about these modern righteous causers. That they say the debate's over. These people are just, the debate's over. And, and they just give us the wave of the hand here at the Institute. Well, it's the Institute. The Abbey of Institute. We don't listen to them. Why not? Why can't you actually debate us? Why? Because you would lose. And that's the real problem. So we, that piece is wonderful. We also had a really good piece this week on the 19th century origins of uh, black liberation theology and critical race theory. This is by Jim Peterson. Again, not a, not a trained historian, but going out and looking, just following the information, following the, the breadcrumbs, so to speak, and finding where all this goes. And again, this gets back into the period of Reconstruction. So Reconstruction births these things. What we're seeing with critical race theory today, which is a very dangerous ideology for not for everybody in America. I mean, when you go into the, uh, if you look at the titles of books that are being published, if you just change the race on the cover of the book from white to black, I mean, these things would be seen as a, as incredibly racist. 
And that's what critical race theory is. And of course, this is having a dramatic impact on American politics. So I think that Jim Peterson did a great job in pointing out where this comes from. It also comes from the Frankfurt School. It fits nicely within that. This very deconstructionist school of and and uh, you know Marxist background here. So I mean, all of this works together, and I think that's where Reconstruction is part and parcel of this. You don't have these things without Reconstruction. And then, of course, you have Boyd Cathy's piece on Tuesday. Uh, aggressive abroad and despotic at home, the quote from Robert E. Lee, where um, he pointed out that the real problem with America after we got to the end of the war was going to be the way that it conducted itself uh, both at home and abroad. And as Lee said, we would be a despotic at home and aggressive abroad. And the image that we used for that piece, which I, th I thought was funny, was the Uncle Sam, I want you FDR, stay and finish the job. And you look at that, the juxtaposition, I mean, it says so much in that just, just that particular image. Uncle Sam, the symbol of American empire, which we get after the war is over, the aggressive abroad, and Franklin Roosevelt, the American aggressor of Uncle Sam wanting Franklin Roosevelt to finish the job. And this is a poster that was used for the Independent Voters Committee of the Arts and Sciences for Roosevelt. Think about what that says, the Arts and Sciences for Roosevelt. <laughs> the modern historians. FDR, we need you to finish the job of becoming a king, King Franklin. We need big government here, and we need the empire abroad. This is what we need for America to be successful. That's certainly part of Reconstruction. Franklin Roosevelt would have been impossible to have without Abraham Lincoln. It's a continuation of these things. And I think when you start looking at history in the long durée, as Browdell called it, you can't just compartmentalize everything. Well, we have this little period. This is what historians do. They're so myopic. And they get so involved in their one little topic. You know, I am the expert on uh, the role of grocery stores in the expansion of uh, consumer culture in Tampa, Florida. And I, I know everything about that. But then you ask them about some, I, don't, I mean, they, they try to pretend like they know things. And you see it all the time on Twitter and other places. You would think some of these quote-unquote experts at these big institutions would know some basic history about some things. But they don't because they wrote a monograph about some stupid thing from some stupid place that nobody cares about, and yet they got a tenure-track position based on that because these are all uh, acolytes of uh, Michel Foucault, which is just deconstructing everything down to the smallest level. And we're going to write some monograph about that. And it's ridiculous. I mean, it's, we don't have the broad view of history anymore. But you have this idea of FDR staying and finishing the job. What job is he finishing? Well, he's finishing the job of the New Deal and the war. And the war brings about an American society that's never lost its wartime footing. In fact, when Truman uh, assumes office after Franklin Roosevelt dies, it's one of the things we don't really realize about Truman. We were supposed to get rid of all of these programs that were created during the war. We just renamed them, and they became something else. And I remember when I was an undergraduate, there was a political a leftist political science professor, and I had a friend of mine who was, you know, we were into the conservative cause and everything we're out there, and we're arguing with all these professors all the time. And he said something at that time because, of course, I was just, you know, the Republican, and I didn't know a whole lot of things. And he said something that I think stuck with me, and he said, you know what the problem is? We've never left a wartime footing in the United States. Now, he's speaking simply about the military. This is true. We haven't ever left that wartime footing, and that's dangerous because the military and American foreign policy helps the domestic policy work because if you're going to agree to this very large military-industrial complex, as Eisenhower called it, then you're going to also agree to the militarization of the domestic economy as well. We're going to fight poverty. It's a war on poverty. Well, we're going to, to win a war, you've got to do everything you can to win a war, we're going to fight COVID. It's a war on COVID. Well, what are we willing to do? Shut everything down. Put everybody at home. Shut everything up. Close the economy. Pump 
trillions of dollars. I mean, Biden's new proposal to have uh, uh, the economy six trillion dollars. This is exactly what you're seeing with this reconstruction period. It was a waste. The amount of money spent wasted in the United States. And Yarborough, Paul Yarborough on Thursday points this out. I mean, this is the real issue in America. We don't really have good Jeffersonians anymore. We don't have a real conservative interest in federalism. When I say Jeffersonians, I'm talking about the old Republicans who were conservative. Some people, well, Jefferson wasn't really conservative. Well, no, a lot of ways Jefferson wasn't conservative, particularly in Virginia. But he was conservative when it came to federalism. He believed that the states had primacy and that the general government should be generally limited to the enumerated powers that were spelled out in Article 1, Section 8 primarily. But you had others that were part of this that were even more concerned. I mean, John Taylor of Caroline and Nathaniel Macon and ultimately John Randolph of Roanoke and all of these people, the tertium quids, these people were important because they were there to say no. And when we did the piece, you know, when, when Richard Weaver points out, well, yeah, I mean, the thing about Calhoun, he pointed out the Constitution was a negative. It was a no. It was there to say no. You can't do these things. Not there to say yes. It's there to say no. But not to the Reconstruction acolytes. Not to the neoconservatives. Not to the left. It's not there to say no. It's there to say yes. So Yarborough points out that, yeah, we really don't have anything anymore that would be considered to be conservative. There's nothing there. These United States are gone. we replaced by the United States. What does all of this mean? And I want to wrap up with Travis Holt's wonderful piece on Friday. I love it when Travis Holt sends us stuff to, to put on the website because it's very reminiscent of Faulkner and these old early 20th century short stories. In fact, uh, there was an email thread I was in that pointed out some of the great stuff that Faulkner had written and how you had this uh, one of his characters you know, with the dog and they were, they were looking at the land. And how that land had taken care of them. And this piece by Travis Holt, Time, is the same thing. He and one of his uh, relatives are out stomping around some old family ground. And they come across the foundation of their old house out there. And they're looking at it. And this was where that land reared this man. He's 80 years old. It's where, they, it's where this land reared this man. And all the family connections. It's what made him who he was. And Holt looks at it as a way to think about your elders and to listen to what they say. But in so many ways, it's also to commune with the things of the past. It's not just about listening to what they say. It's about communing with who they are. And one of the things the left and even the neoconservatives want Southerners to accept is that their relatives were evil people and to disown them. That's really what they want you to do. And this is just, it's evil to say these things. It's evil. We should disown these people. We shouldn't honor these people. None of them. They're traitors. They're evil. Now, maybe that's okay for Alan Gelzo. He has no Confederate ancestors. But imagine someone saying that to Alan Gelzo about his people. I'm sure you could go back in time and look through Gelzo's family history. And in Europe, you could probably find some People that would do some things that we wouldn't do today. Should we say that Alan Gelzo should announce those people and say they're evil? That's like saying part of him, his blood, it's corruption of blood. You're evil because of what your ancestors did. I mean, you should disown them. You should not like them anymore. You should tell them they're wrong. Tear them down. Not honor them. Not call them honorable people. They're evil people. This is what these people want to happen in the South. And also, by default, I mean, even though Gelzo was, well, you know, Washington, well, he owned slaves, and so, you know, but I mean, Washington is Washington. We can't tear him down. We can't tear down Thomas Jefferson. They weren't traitors. You see, this is where they have to start splitting hairs, because if you say, well, anybody that had slaves has to come down, well, then you're going to take down the entire founding generation, or countenance slavery or anything else. You're going to take it all down. You're going to take down the Constitution. So, but no, okay, so we can't do that. So we'll say if they were traitors. Well, did the British not say these people were traitors? Were they traitors at all? I mean, they were traitors to their king. Oh, but that deserved to happen. You know, this is a, this, 
You see, they have to start, instead of just saying, no, shut up. This is what I said on my own podcast. So the answer should be, no, shut up. You want to take down the statue of Lincoln? No, shut up. You want to take down the statue of Robert E. Lee? No, shut up. Stop being a little petulant child and just shut up. That's really what should happen. So, I love the pieces this week. I think there was so much good stuff. If you're not reading our website every day, if you're not getting our Daily Dose of Dixie, you're really missing out. Because this is the kind of stuff we do, and it's so important for us to keep these pieces going. Share them around on social media. Rate this podcast where you get podcasts. Let people know you're listening to the Institute, and you're reading the Institute, and that you're getting something out of it, that's getting something valuable out of this, because this is why we do it. We do it to help reorient America about the real beauty of the Southern tradition and the real danger of the righteous cause myth and some of the other parts of American society that are truly dangerous. All right. Until next time, good day. <laughs>